Well, she's probably driving. Testing one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Good morning. Good morning. Let's get back on here. Wait. Grab an outline and a purple ribbon. With who? Renee. Oh. I think we'll get started. Bruce, was there anything you wanted to say about? I'm good. Oh, you're good. So, welcome. It's Ash Wednesday, and uh, we will have a, a, a brief, like a 10-minute service of confession and prayer and application of ashes at the end of this lesson. Um, and so this is the introduction to a seven-week a series on Jesus is the question and you can look up there and see that it's based upon a book a book by Dr. Martin Copenhaver who is the president of Andover Newton Theological Seminary uh, people ask me where is Andover Newton those of you who have a, a little uh, got your phone with you can check it out on Google if you would um, but it is has a very good reputation I think it's a United Church of Christ and Presbyterian uh, seminary so um, in New yeah where where is it in Boston okay that's okay we got that anyway he's a good writer uh, it's a good book, but it's not necessary for this class. I will be incorporating about half of his stuff and half of my feelings about it as we go, which is the easiest way to teach. So we're looking at Jesus is the question. Okay. Or, or the pastor can repeat the question too, but uh, either way. Jesus is the question. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks this day for the joy we share together as the people of God. We thank you that we can gather together in your name. We ask you to be with us on this special day. Ash Wednesday, a day when we recall our humanity, our sinfulness, our wayward ways. We pray that you would strengthen us through your holy word 
and guide us this day as we go forth to be your servants. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So, the object is, today we're going to cover basic overview of what do we mean by Jesus is the question. And when I finish that, as I told a couple people here, or maybe it was just Carol, um, that uh, I just felt something was missing. And then we, Pastor Bruce and I decided we'd add in the prayer service uh, at the end. And I still felt there's something missing here. And so fortunately, I was working on next week's lesson. Uh, Jesus is the question, and I was on the first question, uh, which is compassion. So we will look at that um, today. Uh, I hope if I can move along and not get stuck on something, and we'll see Jesus ask a question of compassion. And you'll be surprised at what it is. And so this is our start for Jesus is the question. Okay, what we'll try to discover, and we're not going to look at all of them, believe me, uh, the 307 questions that Jesus is asked by others and the three that he answers. Sounds strange, doesn't it? But we'll pull them together. Now, this guy's going to be our guide or gal, this person, this thing, uh, as we go through trying to help understand what the question is. So here, here's our calendar of learning. And of course, this has already changed if I move compassion up to the first week. And believe me, there's enough material there that we will cover it at other times. So we've got so many questions and compassion, faith, and doubt, questions about mercy and love, questions about healing and abundance, questions that Jesus answers. Now all those appear he asks. These he answers about who he is. And so in a way, that's a question about identity. I saved it till last. Uh, if you ordered the book or you have the book, um, Copenhaver has it first. And I just felt that I wanted to kind of hold the whole thing in, in obeyance the way Jesus did. And so this is the identity question. Then we'll get to the questions from the cross and the questions from the risen Christ. So those are the dates that when we'll do it. Um, and you'll know that because the risen Christ is there on the 31st, It'd be one, two, three. April 4th is Easter this year. Okay, we want to look at the power of a question. Sometimes think of all the questions you ask, and I'm going to target a few here uh, that you ask. Questions that you ask elicit information. I could go down through the whole room and say, uh, from where did you come? Now, we always do it with a hanging part at Sippel. Uh, where'd you come from? Uh, that's what you say to people. <laughs> but that's asking information. Uh, where did you get that nice mask? You know, I'm just trying to get some information there. Or questions inspire people to discover something new. Um, think how often in, in our classes, you've been in the class before, you've asked a question about a word. And then we go back and look at the background of the word, look at the root of the word. And we're going to do that with question today. And so you're going to elicit some information there to find out more about it and help you discover something new. Um, where did you buy your car? You know, I get that once in a while. Once in a while. My car were a different color. My wife thinks I get it more. But she's watching, so I won't say anymore. 
uh, questions persuade. Now that sounds strange. You would think that statements persuade, but questions can persuade too. Um, that's how attorneys win cases in court, by questioning and making arguments through their questions and ultimately persuading the jury. And so if you're called for jury duty and you're into that last group uh, and the attorneys are there, they ask you questions that give them insight as to whether you might be already prejudiced toward that subject. Um, I got called oh, soon after we got here, uh, back 2000 and I guess it was this century, uh, 2005 or six, uh, and went to court uh, to be a juror, and it happened to be an assault case of a husband who assaulted his wife. Um, and so as they started asking questions, uh, they said, you know, would you have any problems with finding a verdict one way or another uh, in favor of the gentleman or in favor of the woman. And, and I had to raise my hand and say, you know, I'm in the middle, in the middle of counseling someone who was bodily assaulted by their spouse. And you're dismissed. It was a quick way out. I didn't even get mileage on that one, I don't think. Uh, but. Questions can persuade. Questions stimulate thought. Think of the questions that you have that you might run home and try to find the answer to, whether it's in the dictionary, whether it's in a recipe, whether it's on TV, or questions that you have uh, that stimulate your thought. Uh, I can think, you know, if some of you know that I'm kind of uh, a nut about television sports, uh, and if it if it's a ball or a puck, I watch it. Now, if it's a ball or a fish, I watch it. So uh, I have all these things that recorded, and I'll go to press a button and say my recordings, please. Then I go down the recordings. I have to pick one out. Then I pick it out. Then I have to find that channel. Sometimes last night. Good, good example. Well, it ended up being a bad example, but it started out as a good example. As Peg said, isn't Michigan State playing basketball tonight? It's, I was sitting there reading or something. And so I said, I don't know. So I went to a number of stations that I thought would have it. Uh, I went to the networks, and I went to 401, not thinking that I should go to ESPN. I went to the Big Ten Network because I knew that they were playing another Big Ten team. And finally, I went out and I went in the wastebasket and got the newspaper, went to the sports <laughs> section and found out it was on ESPN. Went to ESPN and watched the basketball game. And so with it stimulated my thoughts as to where all the places that that game might have been televised. Uh, other things, questions will stimulate your thoughts. Um, I know once in a while I'll have a question and say, gee, I ought to think about writing a book about that. Uh, and I've still been writing. A funny thing happened on the way to the altar, but that, that's been 55 years in the making and someday it'll be a book, who knows. Questions forge intimacy. You ask a question, you're dating someone, do you love me? It can forge intimacy. Or where are you, who are you gonna go with to a show? Well, we go with so-and-so. And you forge your intimacy in that way. So that's the power of a question. Questions just cover our whole lifespan. But the big question with which we want to deal is a question that Jesus asked his disciples. Later he asked those who arrested him. 
And then he later still, it was asked of Mary at the empty tomb. This is a question that should be on our mind throughout this entire study. And that's, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? It was a question that was asked by the angels at the open grave. And that's, um, the Roman numerals will refer to the book. And if it's in the Bible, I'll have it listed in, in that way. Okay, so many questions. And this is a quote from Dr. Copenhaver. Have you noticed that in the Gospels, Jesus asks a ton of questions? In every situation, he's asking questions. I think Jesus may have asked even more questions than Socrates ever did. Well, Socrates lived a longer life, and he built his whole philosophy on asking questions and going to places we have been stimulating thought and emerging things. Jesus asks more questions than he is asked. And this becomes very, very intriguing at this point. Because in just the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus himself asked 307 different questions questions. He is asked by others 183 questions, of which he answers very few. We'll, we'll see why as we go through the class. There are two studies that said he only answered three questions. Now, I have to give it away a little bit to say he brought many questions into a stimulating single general question. But there are really only basically three subjects that he covers. However, there's others that say, well, he answered as many as eight questions. But that's the most you can find anywhere. We're going to ha handle all that when we get to week five. And we'll look at those. Okay, ministry and questions. Jesus lived a life of questions. Luke 2, 46. Here's where we can begin. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And then these are Jesus' first recorded words in the Gospels when he says, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my Father's house? And so there's the beginning of his questions. Now, a teacher is called a rabbi in Jesus' day. And it's a name by which he was often called. Rabbis interpreted the Talmud. The Talmud was written somewhere toward the end of the second century, about 280, somewhere in there. It's a Jewish book. It's used still today. Uh, it's a book of questions and answers that help you follow the faith. Um, remember the Torah, first five books, and you have the prophets, and then you have history. But the Talmud is like their catechism. That's a good way to put it. And the questions that are asked in there seek very, very precise answers. There are questions about dietary restrictions. This is where you get answers about kosher kitchens and all the things that take place in, in Orthodox Jewish homes today. Property and ownership, who you will give your property to when you die. It tells you what time of day you ought to pray. It's got law, ethics, customs, history. 
Those are all there in the Talmud. Yet even those questions, when we get up here and we start talking about all these questions, they are fundamentally about life. About life. What kind of plate do you put on for such and such a food? Um, why can't you mix dairy with meat? Uh, I don't know what all the laws are, but there's lots of strange laws in there that we see. But these laws tell how people can live with each other. Um, I worked for a conservative Jew for about a year, and um, Bob was an extremely intelligent person. Um, started his own company, wasn't big, it operated out of the back of his station wagon, then it went into a small retail store where we worked, uh, but he was out on the road all the time selling shirts and sweaters uh, to fraternity houses. And he just traveled everywhere, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and Harvard, and all those places. He'd be out on the road uh, for a good month. We'd fill, we'd jam his station wagon full of samples, they call them. Then he'd set up, it's kind of pyramid thing, he'd set up one person in a fraternity to be the salesperson. They would get a cut, and then he would get the majority, of course, of the money, because he paid for the material. But he had a brother who was a flake. I, I don't know how else to, to call Jerry. Um, but uh, sadly, Jerry ultimately committed suicide. But he, he was still, I call him a flake because he was very strange. And he was always asking dumb questions or asking lots of questions about his brother because he'd stop by the store while his brother was out on the road. Now, when his parents were going to die, who were they going to leave their estate to? was governed, could have been governed by the laws of the Talmud. Um, just the, uh, a neat aside, Bob uh, was a graduate of St. John's University, St. John's College in uh, Baltimore, which is a college where you go and you don't choose any electives. They tell you this is what you're going to take to get your degree. And uh, you have to take the basic languages of Greek, Latin, you have to learn them, use them. And uh, so he would say, and he was Jewish, but uh, he would say, we'd ask him, ask a question, see, Bob, what do you do with all your time out there on the road? You know, those fraternities can't just get together for you at night, you're there during the daytime. And he'd say, well, I usually do a little reading uh, one of my favorite things to do is to translate in my head from the Greek New Testament into Latin and then from the Latin into the English in his head. You know, it's like um, I, I asked, I had a gal, in, in, uh, uh, a lady in Greek and in uh, French, but she taught French and Spanish at South Carolina State University. And I used to ask her, what language do you dream in? Think about that. Because she used her Spanish extensively with us because of our um, inter bringing together blacks and Hispanics and whites into one congregation. Uh, she was there oftentimes as the interpreter for uh, the two large Hispanic families that we had. What was her answer? Her answer was, I don't know. <laughs> Seriously, that was her answer. She says, I think sometimes it's French, and occasionally it'll be Spanish, and most of the time it's English. So, um, she was a neat gal. In the Seder meal among the Jews, 
The youngest child always asks the question. That's how it begins. Why is this night different from all other nights? Just what you all wanted to know. In the Gospels, Jesus is addressed as rabbi. He's called rabbi because he is, among other things, a teacher. And a good rabbi knows how to ask questions. Okay, I want to now look at a comparison between questions and parables. Because there are similarities. Both of them are teaching tools. Jesus asking questions, Jesus telling parables. In both of them, however, Jesus communicates indirectly. Now, why do I say that? Because the listener has to do some of the work. Simple one. Think of the story of the Good Samaritan. And what does Jesus end up asking the lawyer? Who was the neighbor? And the neighbor, of course, is the Good Samaritan. In a lecture, direct communication is appropriate. That's what I do. I guess I do it best, because I don't do the other part very well. But in questions and parables, the goal is not to communicate knowledge, but is to develop a new understanding in the listener. So when Jesus says, and who was the neighbor, it causes the listener to try to figure it out. You know, was it the rabbi? Was it the scribe? Um, or was it the Samaritan who came along? You see, information is not the goal. Transformation is the goal. That's probably the key. And we'll hit upon that, and I'll show you how that happens with compassion later on here. Okay. The root word, maybe, but the word that's part of question is quest. The quest. What happens when you go on a quest? A journey. You're seeking something. It's an interesting word. The question would contain that. Easy answers give us a degree of finality. This is the way it is. You know, what color is this nail here? It's purple. Um, or in church terms, it's violet. But anyway, answers offer conclusions, oftentimes. But with Jesus, when we're looking at parables and his questions, questions invite us to enter into further reflection. Further reflection. Answers close and questions open. Is that clear? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now the quest sends us on the journey, on the journey in search of the answer or the discovery. I don't know how many of you were watching the last night, night before last. Um, we had the rocket at 11.59 blasted off from Cape Canaveral had 60 satellites aboard that are now up there transmitting all kinds of things. And as my understanding, the majority of those were to be able to try to reach out with Wi-Fi and internet to uh, little hinterlands among our country. I don't know if it took in the world or not. So. We reach this point where, with so many questions, this is where our study will end. Right here, we figured out what questions are. Now you know. Or would it be better to say, this is where our study begins. So I'm going to go to where our study begins. Because now, now with that background, we can look at Jesus' teaching in a way that will draw us into prayer 
and reflection, meditation, and discussion of the questions that Jesus asked. And we hope we'll be able to do all of those. Okay, hang with me a minute. I'm going to get out of this program somehow and get into compassion. Okay. Oops, better go up here to slideshow. I'm amazed that I can do this. <laughs> no. Have I done it? Okay. This was going to be the start of next week, and I may include a little bit of it next week, but we're going to look at Jesus is the question, and we're going to have questions about compassion. Next week, we'll have faith and doubt. But today, we're just going to cover compassion. Um, because we want to take it one question at a time, uh, not try to cover everything. So let's start with compassion. Here it tells us in Scripture that the Lord is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and fulfilled with unfailing love. Psalm 145 and that's uh, the New Living Testament, New Living Bible, if you want to put it that way. Okay, we'll look at this question now, and let's look at Luke 7, 36 to 50. Does everybody have it? Luke 7, 36 to 50? Mm -hmm. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Okay. 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. Now, I wanted to show how that looked. And I went into pictures online to try to show you how that would have looked in Jesus' day because of what happens. But uh, I could not find a picture that was suitable to what I have learned, what archaeology has taught us. Um, so let's understand, like at the Last Supper, Jesus didn't say, look, all you guys get on that side of the table, we want to take your picture. Uh, it was probably in the round. The tables might have been that high off the ground. You ate in a prone position, kind of laid down on your side and ate, uh, and with your feet sticking out. And that's important to this story because of what happens, and you'll see in a minute. The question that Jesus asked, the question of compassion is, do you see this woman? Now he's talking to a group of Pharisees. So let's look at verse 37 and following. And a woman in the city who was a sinner, having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet. Now think if they're laying prostate or on their side at a table, and their feet would be sticking out. Um, she was stood behind him. And evidently, in those days, I'll put it up here in a minute, um, that many of the houses you could just walk in and out of during the daytime. Um, there were no great, wonderful doors on some of these houses. So it was just as easy for them to open the door and let the air blow through because it could have been hot too. She stood behind him at his feet weeping and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with the comment, with the ointment. Um, some of the pictures that I saw were very strange of of her kissing his feet that I didn't put up here, believe me. Um, 
Three, uh, you know. Now, now when the Pharisee who invited him, 30, verse 39, saw it, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him. She is a sinner. Jesus spoke up and said to him, said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. That's whose house he was in. Teacher, he replied, speak. A certain creditor, this is Jesus now, a certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii, the other 50. And when they could not pay, he canceled the debts for both of them. Now which of them will love him more? And Simon answered, eh, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, you've judged rightly. Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence, she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is given, love, little is forgiven, loves little. Then he said to her, "Your sins are forgiven." But those who were at table with him began to say among themselves, "Who is this who even forgives sins?" And he said to the woman, "Your faith has saved you. Go in peace." And so. It's a strange start to questions of compassion, or is it? How do we get to know someone? How will Simon come to know this woman? Uh, does observing help us to know someone? Sure, immediately. Um, in our society today, you know someone by the way they dress, you probably immediately know someone by what race they are. You might know someone on how they act. You look at them and you take a guess at how old they are, but you know you can put them in one generation or another. So by observing, it helps you to know someone. Um, the only observation that Simon has made about this woman is what? She's a sinner. It's a judgment. It's an absolute answer. Do questions help us know someone? You know, how? Where are you from? How many years have you lived here? Do you play golf very often? Do you always miss those short putts? You know, whatever it might be, you, you learn about someone. The woman is known as a sinner, so she must have been known in the little city as a sinner. And you know, I don't know where you came from, but in my hometown, we had a red light district. And I mean, we all knew where it was, but none of us ever went there. <laughs> I never was there. I went by it, it was right there on Water Street. You see, and there was a red light. You know, I think of that when people put red lights in their posts at Christmas time. Uh, I, I always remember that, the red light district. And you go elsewhere. Uh, there's a famous one in Ketchikan, Alaska. If you've ever been in Ketchikan along the water there, there's a famous uh, prostitution houses. Uh, list. So, the Pharisees, though, knowing that she was a sinner, would have nothing to do with her. That was it. They made their decision. So, let's look at what the definition of compassion is. It's a deep awareness of the suffering of another person coupled with 
the wish, the desire to relieve it, that becomes compassion. That's from the American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language. It's about that big. Now, that dictionary also gives you synonyms and tells you where to look for synonyms. And under synonyms, it lists pity, commiseration, sympathy, condolence, empathy. All those words would indicate kindly concern for that person. But now if we look at compassion or pity in the Bible, you often find pity in the Bible. Uh, Jesus looked upon someone with pity or someone else looked upon someone with pity. Uh, in the original languages of the Bible, both Hebrew and Greek, the words for compassion or pity are often translated mercy. Mercy. So very quickly, here's the story. We've, we've gotten into it already. We're at the house of Simon the Pharisee. The woman crashes the party. I like to do that. That's cool. She brings gifts of ointment and tears and herself. The houses back then were somewhat open. I already mentioned that. The woman was known only as a sinner. And she had a jar of ointment and her tears. Kisses Jesus' feet and washes them. Now, she may have intended to wash Jesus' head. That's what Jesus said when he entered the house and Simon didn't do it, didn't apply any ointment. It's a sign of regard and personal grooming that you do that to a person who enters your house in those days. Okay, let's take an inside look very quickly here. Almost done. What does all this have to do with compassion? Ask yourself this question. There is much about myself that I don't see and some I choose to see. And if I go home, as I often do, and sometime later this week, listen to what I said this week, I learn a lot about myself. I learn a little bit about my waistline. I learn that my hair grows downward into my scalp and comes out my chin. Uh, some of those very important things that you can learn. And there are some things I choose to see about myself that uh, as I'm there, and I, I can I can choose to see how how Al back there runs the camera, whether he gets me in the picture with this or uh, where it is. And so when we think about that in church and the way church goes, um, we begin with confession, confession and absolution. I miss that at the four o'clock service. I wish we had a little confession at the beginning. And one of the prayers that we pray is that we confess to sins that we've known and that we've unknown, have not known, that we did unconsciously. So a question of compassion has to do with probing yourself and it also then becomes a reassuring question. Jesus' words to the woman are simply these. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now think through the eyes of all the others who were gathered there with the Pharisees. And Jesus says these words to that woman. Your sins are forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Is this informational or is that transformational? We come back to that, that comment. Now, when we look back, we see that Jesus had compassion. 
He had understanding of who she was and what she had just done. And so he has this pity, this empathy, this understanding with her. But she also had compassion on him in the acts that she performed. So with that, I'll take a couple questions or we can turn to our, our service of prayer, if you'd like. Okay? No, you can you can just cut it off. Yeah.